For all the latest news in North Central Washington, go to ncwlife.com or find us on Facebook. Got a news tip? Email us at news at ncwlife.com or call 888-2020. Hi, and welcome to Life with Lisa Bradshaw. On today's show, I am interviewing a friend, Heather Menzies Zurich. You may know her from the movie Sound of Music and a host of other television shows from the 70s. She was married to late actor Robert Urich. He was in television shows like Vegas, Spencer for Hire, and the movie Lonesome Dove. I have been through a few hardships in my life. I'm a cancer survivor of 21 years and I lost my husband when I was 32, 13 years ago. I met Heather when her husband, Robert, was speaking at a cancer survivor uh, conference at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. I was writing for the Houston paper, and I wanted to meet him because I wanted him to write the foreword for my first book. He eventually did that, and years later, uh, after he passed away from cancer, Heather and I became good friends. And she ended up writing the foreword for my second book, Big Shoes, which was based on the experience of losing my husband. So the ironies of our friendship are difficult but endearing. And we have walked the widow walk together, as we often say. I'm honored to have her on my show here from New York City via Skype. If there is a delay and I seem to be interrupting her, please understand that is the nature of Skype. I'm not being an impolite host. Welcome to the show, Heather. So I'm very excited to have you on the show today, Heather. It seems to be the way I get to talk to you most is if I'm interviewing you. (laughs) How are you? Well, you can call me anytime, Lisa. I know. I know. We do do that, too. Uh, So I recently saw that you are part of an upcoming book, well, a newly released book, Robert Wise, uh, The Motion Pictures. Most people know that you were in The Sound of Music, one of the most iconic films of all time. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, it was one of the most incredible experiences of my life and um, a lot of fun. It didn't feel like work at all. You know, it was just, um, and it took a, it took a long time. It took close to a year to do. So it was, I don't know. I mean, when you're doing a television series, it becomes uh, a way of life. And so this film, felt like that. It felt like a way of life for, for that amount of time. And um, our, the friendships that I've made have lasted, mm-hmm. you know, over, the, over time, decades. So yeah, it was, it was just a, a great experience. And how old were you when you filmed? I was 14. 14. So you'd been acting for a long time, obviously, to get that role. And I know people probably ask you this, but I'm going to ask you too. Did you guys have any idea what you were creating we didn't have a clue you know we just didn't want it to suck um (laughs) um, we just wanted it to make a good you know piece of work and i don't think even robert wise would say that he didn't really know he didn't have a clue that it would you know it's been decade after decade it just never seems to have gone away you know people and i think because people have these huge, you know, flat screen t- TVs now with the, the Blu-ray, you know, uh, DVDs that are r- totally remastered copy of it. Uh, they can sit down and watch it the way it was almost supposed to be seen, you know, anytime they want. So yeah, I think that adds to the longevity of the popularity. Well, and I think that that's true too, the way that people can access movies. It's not long, no longer just a VCR or just a DVD player any, anymore either. It's on TV like it is throughout the year on cable or whatever way you get your television to come through. But to have it on those big screens makes a big difference. They were recently airing or showing Rocky for the first time on a big screen here in our community. And I said to my son, we have to go because you've never seen it like that. And so that's what you're talking about. It enhances the experience. It does. Yeah, they re-released it on the uh, on an anniversary. I think it was last year or the year before that, and they showed it at the AMC Theater over on Forty Second Street. And so I went with my friend, and it was amazing. Wow! I mean, it was this huge screen, and it was all completely digitally remastered. And I saw, I found that I saw things that I forgot about. Oh, right. You know that I or things that I 
never sort of noticed before. So it was, it was great. Just like people who weren't in the movie see things when they see a movie over and over and over again. So you were seeing things, some things for the first time again. Yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah. So what was that like for you? You live in New York City part of the time now, and you walk over to 42nd Street, mm -hmm. take a cab, however you got there, and see all these mm -hmm. people watching this movie, some of them for the first time. Yeah. I sat in the back. <laughs> And, you know, I mean, I don't look like I'm 14 anymore. So, um, but I did, you know, in the elevator going down uh, when it was over, I, you know, there were some people that had been in the theater and they went, oh my gosh, you know? Oh, there you are. Yeah, that was you. <laughs> and you talk about the longevity of the film. I know that you, a few years ago, put together with the rest of the Sound of Music team, a scrapbook that sold out. It was a uh, Sound of Music scrapbook based on collections of, all of the archives that even some of you kept, not just the studio. And that sold out. And so through the years, I know you've been on Oprah, the Today Show, all kinds of different interviews that it, that part of it, the machine of it all, the business part of it, and like doesn't go Lisa. away either. Yes, and my show too. <laughs> uh, that part doesn't seem to go away either. No, it doesn't. It doesn't seem to go away because there's, all, there's you know, constant sort of interest in it. And it always seems to uh, peak a, around an anniversary or a reissue of a DVD or, you know, the, the, the book coming out kind of thing. And they did sell out and they're not, the publisher uh, is not planning on, you know, republishing. So uh, that's it, <laughs> you know. But it was fun to do because we had all this stuff. We had all this material. Uh, in bins, in plastic bins that our mothers had saved over the years. And, and Angela Cartwright and I sat around and we said, we got to do something with this stuff, you know. Uh, and then we came up with the idea of, you know, the fold outs and all the sort of copies of, you know, for example, the ticket to the premiere and a call sheet and, you know, things like that. And all of our own personal photographs that we had been, you know, taking of each other uh, during the during the shoot. So I'm going to show a picture of you with the lion, uh, a picture of you from back in the day. <laughs> Can you tell me that story? I've seen it on Facebook. We're friends on Facebook, too. And I wanted to ask you, tell me about that lion picture. I know a lot, a lot of my friends, what, Heather, what, what was up with that? We, had, we have a friend who used to be an animal trainer for the film. And he had this place out in it's Calabasas where he would keep his animals and um, he was a family friend and he became a director his name is Stuart Raffle and um, uh, we we th these animals were obviously very tame because they were used in film and so we we just went out and did some publicity shots as a favor for him that day and over a couple of days and uh, you know sat on the line and ruffled his hair his, the lion's name was Major and he was like a pussycat he was huge you know he was I think he had all his teeth, but I don't think he had this, all his claws. So that yeah. was that yeah, was the I deal. saw that, that was picture. <laughs> I was thinking, where was your mother standing when you were taking those pictures? That would have been a nervous wreck. <laughs> and would I allow my children to do like, You would no. or you wouldn't? No, yeah. So. The answer would be... But you know, you, uh, you and I have talked about it before. Some of the things you did when you were growing up, you did ballet, correct, in New York City. So you were taking the bus and the subway at a young age. So you were a bit adventurous. So that wasn't too far off scope for you. Yeah, I was. I was, you know, I did a Broadway show when I was 16, and but I was afraid of the subway. This was, you know, a while ago. And I think I had reasons to be afraid of the subway back then. So I would take the bus. But now I, I'm, I've become what they call a subway rat. You know, I'm always in the subway. But I still take ballet. You know, I, I enjoy it. Um, and um, yeah. I'd walk around and <laughs> in the population of New York City. Uh, so the movie, the book, I'm sorry, the book we're talking about uh, that I mentioned earlier is called Robert Wise, The Motion Pictures, and it's written by Joe Jordan. You did an interview for the book. Tell us the premise of the book. Uh, well, I haven't actually read the book yet. I just got it in the mail. Uh, he just sent it to me, but I'm, I'm sort of saving it for my next airplane ride. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's basically about all of the films from what just coming through it, the little that I did. It's about uh, Robert, Robert Wise's experience making uh, each of his films and each chapter uh, devotes itself to a film, you know, like West Side Story, Sound of Music, 
the house, I think it was, was it the house on Haunted Hill or something that he's mm -hmm. very, very well known for. And uh, more, of, more of his professional life than his personal life. So. And what was your, yeah. so you got to talk about your experience being directed by him. Yeah, I did. And the experience as I, you know, doing the film and um, what he was like as a director. Uh, we're directed by many directors. How was he different? He was uh, unbelievably patient um, and kind. Uh, not that other directors weren't, but more so than most. And, um, you know, uh, a, a real perfectionist, you know, which probably helped to put him in the league that he was in. Um, and, uh, and, and also being an editor, uh, you know, he started out as an editor. He could kind of edit in his head while he's shooting and, and you know, save a lot of time. Well, you'd have to have patience. He was directing a bunch of kids, right? In a musical. Yeah. Yeah. He, he only read us the riot act once <laughs> and uh, sat us down and said, I just, I just, I just need to remind you guys that we are making a movie here. Just, it, just in case you forgot that that's what we're doing here. We're making a movie. <laughs> so. You're on the job. Yeah. Uh, let's take a quick break. For people watching, if it sounds like I'm interrupting Heather sometimes, I'm not. There's just a delay because we're Skyping. Fortunately, we can Skype because she's clear in New York City. We're here in Washington, so I'm grateful for the opportunity. We'll take a break and come back. I want to talk about your wonderful late husband, Robert Urich, the foundation you founded and in his honor yeah. when he was still living and the work you continue to do. We'll be back in just a moment. Please join us weekly for the 12th District with yours truly, Carrie Condotta. Check your channel guide for times or go to ncwlife.com for details. So Heather, let's talk about a little bit about how the things we have in common, the history that we share, the unfortunate history that we share. You recently, well, not recently now, six years ago, wrote the forward for my book, Big Shoes, and you and I became friends through Robert Eric's life, your late husband's life, and the work that he was doing. So I'll never forget that day, standing in your kitchen and watching you cry. It was just six months after he died, and you were keeping on with that golf tournament. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's something that he started, you know, and uh, I wanted to continue doing it. And this this particular fund was for the University of Michigan, which is where he received a lot of his treatment. And um, so uh, it, it was on the, uh, this, this, our, that fund was under, it was the, the URIC fund was under the umbrella of the University of Michigan. And um, yeah, it, it, I wanted to continue and did, did for a number of years. Uh, he started the, the golf tournaments because we lived on a golf course and we, we belonged to this particular uh, country club. It was Sherwood Country Club, and um, uh, it was his idea to to do a golf tournament to kind of pay back the university for, you know, helping to uh, try to save his life. Let's and, talk. Um, um, let's back up a little bit to when he was first diagnosed. He was doing the Lazarus Man. We're talking about her late uh, Heather's late husband Robert York. You know him from. TV shows like Vegas and Spencer for Hire. He was also in the movie Lonesome Dove. So he was on a television series when he was diagnosed. He was having great success in his career and his family. Yeah, he was. He was doing a show that he actually really loved. It was a Western based at the time in Santa Fe. And, um, uh, and it was quite successful. And it was picked up for another season. Um, and uh, that was when he found this little pea-sized lump you know, and uh, had it aspirated and, and, and checked out and it came back that it was benign. And they said, oh, you know, men in their mid forties, usually you know, they get little cysts, you know, here and there. But um, so we went to Canada on vacation, which is where our, our summer place is. And um, uh, he said, Heather, this, I have a window of time when we get back before I start the new season of Lazarus. I, I don't want, uh, this may be benign, but I don't want it in my body. Okay. So I'm going to have it taken out. And that's when they discovered that it was malignant. So he went through treatment. You were living in Los Angeles, this, Los Angeles at the time, and he opted for treatment in Michigan. 
Well, he, we, he had treatment in Los Angeles uh, the first time, the, the first go round. And then this, when he was re-diagnosed, he was doing Chicago the Musical in New York, uh, in, on Broadway actually, and um, it came back. You know, the, 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 the little pea-sized lump came back and um, uh, they were on national tour uh, before they got to Broadway. And when they were in Detroit uh, doing Chicago the Musical there, he found out that the University of Michigan Comprehensive Cancer Center did a tremendous amount of research on Cernobial cell sarcoma, which is what he had. So he thought, why not hook up with them and take advantage of their expertise? I remember the, so when I met him, um, I've told you this story before, but I was in the press room because I wrote for the newspaper mm -hmm. in Houston at the time in college, and he came down the stairs. He's the best smelling man I've ever met in real life. I've told you that too. And it was so funny <laughs> because he had his manager there and people around and he, he comes it. down these spiral stairs and he's a big guy, you know, he played football in college. I know all this about him and I am interested in meeting him because I want him to write the foreword for my first book and I want to meet him. And when he comes down the stairs, nobody talked to him. He just kind of stood there. You know, he was just, it was too much, you know, this <laughs> handsome, famous man in this room. Yeah. So I thought, well, I'm going to go talk to him. So I did. And, you know, we had great conversation. And over the year and a half it took to finish my book, he did end up writing the foreword. And it was that through that that I met you and not expecting for you to end up writing the foreword to my second book based on me also losing my husband. And that is uh, a kinship yeah. we never expected when we met all those years ago. I know, we've done the widow walk, haven't we? Mm -hmm. We have. You know, the thing about it too yeah. is this, and, and we're friends uh, personally, and we're friends on Facebook, so we see a lot of what each other shares and the ebb and flow of life. And it's an interesting thing to spend this many years now without him. What is life like for you now? Well, obviously, as you know, uh, it just changes. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a whole new chapter. It's a whole other chapter. I've got people in my life that are very important to me now that he never even met, you know? Um, I, I've never dated again. He was it for me. I, I would have to be hit over the head with a, you know, a hammer. Somebody would have to do that to, for me to be interested. In. Do you know what I mean? I just, I'm not. I do not um, but, you know, I always loved, I loved New York. Uh, and he, when he did Chicago the Music, he learned to love New York. You know, he's, he, because he always hated it. He always, you know, would come in and do the view or the GMA and, and leave, you know, get out of Dodge. But when I was 16, I did that Broadway show and it, it just, I just fell in love with the city and I've always loved it. And I thought, oh, my kids are grown now. Um, you know, there, I, I have no, uh, I don't have to be in any particular place for any particular reason for schools or whatever. And so I thought, you know, why not live this chapter in, in the city that I've always loved? So here I am. And so when you, uh, are, you mentioned your kids, so how much did their dad's mm -hmm. illness have to do with your two older kids, Ryan and Emily, uh, the choices they made in their career? Well, it's interesting because I've been asked that question, you know, and I get conflicting answers from them. But Ryan did say to me once, uh, you know, he was, he want, first of all, he wanted to be a drummer in a rock and roll band. Now, you know, Ryan, so, you, <laughs> you know, you can, can see that. how that could come about. Yes. <laughs> and then he wanted to be an actor. And I thought, oh, he's maybe doing this for the wrong reasons. You know, he's trying to fill some big shoes. And then he, but he got an agent and he was, you know, Doing all that, and so then he said, "I, I want to go to med school," because a friend of his had, had uh, said, "You know, you should really take the MCATs and just see how you do." And he did, and he did really well. So he thought, "Maybe I'll go to med school." And I said, "You know what? It's really expensive. <laughs> That's your really most expensive hard. choice. <laughs> you got to give me a really good reason why you're going down this path." And he said, "Well, I couldn't save my dad, so maybe I can save somebody else." Mm -hmm. So I thought, "Well, who can argue with that?" And, uh, and I think maybe Emily, for the, right, for the same kind of reasons, I never really discussed it with her, but she's kind of a, a bit of a genius, you know, person. 
you know, Ryan has always said, you know, you should be doing this, not me. Um, and so she's an, uh, an emergency room uh, nurse. And little Allie keeps changing her mind about what she wants to do. I mean, every day it's something different. You know, she's, she's changed her major about three times already. Yeah, you and call I told her, her little she Allie, but she's in she, college. She, so she's, that's when you're making all those choices, she's 19, right? She's 19. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's amazing. You know, in my mind's eye, I see this blonde thing running around with Hunter having a, you know, selling lemonade out in the front. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> that's, that's how I see them both in my mind's eye, you know? Yeah. But uh, no, she's doing really well. She'll land on whatever it is she wants to do, I'm sure. Well, that's, that's the, I think, the beautiful thing about the, the way that we have to, well, it, I'm learning. He's just getting ready to leave for college, my son Hunter, and trying not to lean too much, trying to not to push them in a certain direction, letting them figure that out for themselves. And, yeah. you know, that's, that's a whole other chapter of parenting. I feel like that part's... The raising them, the kind of being the person in charge is going away from me. And now I just have to see what he does with what I tried to give him. So you can relate to that. You have grown kids and you have a child who just left home last year. Yeah, and I, and I have all the faith in the world and I'm not worried about it at all that, you know, she will land on, on whatever it is that she wants to do. You know, and I guess maybe the first two were kind of a rehearsal for her, you know. So, um yeah, and they and they all the both both of them, you know, like Ryan, he changed his mind how many times. And Emily wanted to be a chef, <laughs> you know, you know. So, and a friend of ours um, is Emeril Lagasse, and so he said to her, "Look, Em, they're both Ems. Um, I'll sign you. I'll sign you off for this this uh, culinary school that that he was on the board of. I think it's called Johnson and Wales. It's in Vermont, and which is one of the best culinary schools in the in the nation. And he said, "I'll I'll get you in there." But first, you have to work in my restaurant for six months in Vegas. You have to work in the kitchen. And then you come and tell me that this is what you want to do. That's a and great so she idea. did that. She went to Vegas and got a little apartment and, you know, worked in the kitchen. And six months later, she said, forget this. Perfect. I'm not doing this. I don't want to do this. Yeah, yeah, that's a tough industry. You have to love it, as he does, I'm sure. Uh, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, let's just talk a little bit more specifically about the Robert Urich Foundation for Cancer Research, that you've continued the work you're doing now in any way that we can be of support of it. We'll be back in just a moment. Is your vehicle in need of a quick oil change or tune-up before hitting the road this summer? Stop by Quick Lube and Tune, the home of the good guys at 610 South Wenatchee Avenue. So just in finishing up, I wanted to go back and touch base about the Robert Urich Foundation for Cancer Research. We talked about the fund that you two started mm -hmm. together before he passed away that was under the umbrella of the University of Michigan Comprehensive Cancer Center. What have you done since then and where does the foundation stand today? Well, we, we started, I started it after he died and it's kind of a, a, a pretty much a grassroots foundation at this point. We have um, been in partnership with the CERN, with the CERN Sarcoma Foundation of America, SFA, and, and contributed to their foundation quite a bit through our foundation. Um, it's yorkfoundation.org if anybody wants to go online and find out about it. I'm doing a big fundraiser up in Canada this summer, um, and uh, it's with auction items, and, and I've got a band, and we're going to have dancing, and it's kind of a carnivalesque theme uh, because my son-in-law rents out all this this gaming equipment and so you know a karaoke machines and all that kind of stuff so it's and I've got face painters for kids and and a dance band and a bar big barbecue you know kind of things it's going to be on my property actually in Canada in the front part of the property so it's August 27th so if anybody, anybody's in the area you'll be able to find out more about it online on the on the website well good and you guys have raised thousands and thousands of dollars over the years, doing all kinds of things from fashion mm -hmm. shows in Los Angeles at the yeah. Beverly Hills Hotel to the golf tournament that we talked about earlier. And, and there's a lot of honor in the work came, that you're doing. You came to that, yeah. I did, I came to both of those. I'll never forget, Thank you. so funny, I ended up sitting next to Wayne Gretzky and I was aware of him, but not largely. And my cousin was there with me and she mentioned to her husband, oh yeah, I sat by a game. I, I knew of him a bit better, but she knew nothing of him. And she said, I sat by some guy named Wayne Gretzky and he flipped out. 
<laughs> he was thinking, do you know who you that know, is? Like, you know, know. It's just a neighbor of mine. You know, that was Wayne Gretzky, you know, um, but and a golf buddy of Bob's, you know, but he would help out uh, every time we did the golf tournaments, he would show up and help out and he was very giving of his time. And especially with the auction, he would donate tickets to the game, the hockey game, and then Emeril would throw in his plane, you know, so they could take a private plane to wherever the game was. And I mean, it was a lot of fun, so yeah. Good friends to have. So if you want more information, mm -hmm. it's yorkfoundation.org to find out about the event happening in August. But also just if you want to read about the work they've done over the years, the strides they're making against cancer, you can take a look at that website. Thank you so much for being here. I always love talking to you, whether it's in an interview or in person or over the phone. So um, thanks for taking the time. Enjoy your wonderful afternoon in New York City. And we'll be in touch. Thank you, Lisa. Take care. OK, we will. All righty. Again, if you want information about the Robert Urick Foundation for Cancer Research, visit urickfoundation.org. Thanks for being on the show, Heather. Thanks for joining me today, everyone. I'll be back next week. Stay up to date with what's happening in North Central Washington. Go to the NCW Life community calendar at ncwlife.com.